Imagine your science professor was Indiana Jones. That's the best way I can characterize my guest today, Mark andre Myers, a distinguished professor of mechanical engineering, material science, and nanoengineering at UC San Diego. His work ranges from the material science of toucan beaks to mechanical metallurgy and high explosives. He's also an explorer of the Amazon jungle, speaks five languages, and has written six novels. Welcome to Molecular Podcasting. I'm your host, Darren Lapomi. I'm a professor of nanoengineering at UC San Diego. I'm a trained chemist interested in ways in which electronic materials can be made soft and tough for applications ranging from cheap, indestructible solar panels to wearable medical devices to tactile interfaces for virtual reality. This podcast, however, is not about those things or about any scientific topic in particular. Instead, it's about the people who practice science, their inspirations, and their lives and careers. So rather than being another science podcast, this is a meta-scientific or maybe peri-scientific podcast, if that makes sense. Probably doesn't, but that's fine. Professor Mark Myers is a Brazilian-born distinguished professor and senior colleague at my home institution, UC San Diego. While he has hundreds of publications and tens of thousands of citations, this conversation is principally about his life and writing career. We start out with a discussion of a recent expedition deep in the Amazon jungle in which Mark's goal was to retrace the steps of Roosevelt and Rondon, a Brazilian explorer. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation as much as I enjoyed participating in it. So you just returned from New York City where you were uh, giving a guest lecture at the Explorers Club. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what the topic of your your talk was? Yes. Uh this was a, a momentous event in, in my life. It's something that only happens uh, once. Uh, like Andy Warhol said, we all have our 15 minutes of fame. I went there. I was invited by the Explorers Club to give a lecture on the River of Doubt, the Centennial Expedition. And this is an expedition that I organized uh, on the centennial of the famous Roosevelt Rondon Expedition of 19. 13, 1914, where he almost lost his life. Okay, and how long had you been preparing for this uh, expedition? This came to me, uh, the, the aha moment came when I closed the last page of the book by Candice Millard, The River of Doubt. I had something that told me, Mark, you have to go and repeat that expedition using approximately the same means of transportation that they used uh, on horseback, on foot, and, and by canoe, and following, tracking the, uh, the same uh, territory that they tracked, but also adding to this uh, expedition a uh, scientific component in the same way as, as Roosevelt and Rondon, they, have a, they had a scientific goal when they went down. They had with them naturalists, they had a geologist, uh, they had uh, uh, what they call a mammologist, which falls into the category of an ornithologist. And so they, they really were collecting information all along their expedition. So I wanted to keep this spirit alive. Mm -hmm. And this uh, ties in very well with your, your scientific work. So uh, I, I attended a lecture of yours a few months ago and you passed around samples and you're well known in the, in the scientific community for studying the microstructure of uh, toucans, beaks, and, uh, and interesting biological materials. So, so tell us a little bit about, uh, about your work. And, and this is almost like biological uh, uh, archaeology, right? Uh, so you, you take the, find these materials and study them. Yes, um, my, my scientific career actually started on, in a very different direction. I did my PhD uh, with explosives using shock, studying shock waves. I started this in 1972 and I spent, uh, I believe, 44 years uh, blowing things up. Uh, I did uh, uh, explosives. I would set up as a graduate student my own explosives. It would be unheard of nowadays. I would just go there, cut the explosives up and, and, and uh, accelerate flyer plates <coughs> in controlled environment. Then I went to Brazil and I, I went to work for the Military Institute of Engineering. And there I, uh, 
I was able to set up the first explosives uh, laboratory in, in Latin America, uh, collecting explosives, uh, um, uh, mounting them, assembling them, uh, and doing some, some meaningful research. Then I came to the United States. I happened to be very fortunate that this, at the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. They, uh, I was there. I organized a conference on, on Explomet on explosives. We had a big uh, facility there. And I continued my career on explosives, uh, but I think that at some point uh, I had this desire to, to study something different, biological, and, and uh, the, the, the critical moment happened to me when I was actually a, a, a young uh, adult. I was like 20 years, I, I was with my father. My father was hunting, he loved to hunt, and I was laying in, in a little forest and I saw the toucans flying about my head. Uh, and so I, I walked around and I found this uh, skeleton of a toucan and I lifted the beak and the beak was extremely light uh, and yet tough. It resisted torsion, bending, and I was puzzled by it. And this image stayed with me for 40 years and every now and then I would tell a graduate student, let's study it, but nobody demonstrated any interest. They <laughs> were very focused on their own work. And until I got one student, Matt Schneider, he actually did some research and we got the beak of a toucan. We purchased it here in Fallbrook and uh, from Jerry Jennings and we got the beak and then we studied the beak and it was like uh, a tremendous success. We were um, in National Geographic, we were featured in, 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 the, in the news media and so I got excited with it and I uh, studied the toucan and I also studied the abalone shells uh, under the disguise of army funding, uh, using as a uh, uh, motivation that it would be a good material that would inspire uh, armor. And so I expanded from there into a number of materials. And then I saw this opportunity, and I used to go to Brazil, I used to fish. I am fairly familiar with the Amazon. I have gone there several times. I know the Amazon fairly well. And you're from Brazil originally. I am from Brazil. And uh, so my father used to go fishing and hunting. The people from my hometown used to go fishing and hunting in the Amazon. The first time I went there, I spent 48 hours on a truck uh, driving through the Brazilian hinterland until we arrived at the river. We actually got stuck and we had to be pulled out by, uh, by ox, oxen. And so I, uh, I went and started picking materials from the uh, Amazon, like the scales of the Arapaimas, uh, the, two, the, two, the teeth of the piranha, and uh, there's a seed that has unique properties, the Janina seed. And so I found that, that, it, that uh, meshing this, uh, this expedition with uh, the collection of some specimens uh, gave it, enriched it. And so this is uh, in line and in the spirit of the original Roosevelt expedition. And Roosevelt considered himself, and probably was in those days, he was a scientist because he was a, he was very knowledgeable in, in, in naturalist. He, since childhood, he, he, had, he had dedicated himself to it. And he really emphasized uh, in his book that he wrote about his expedition all of the observational aspects. And, and he was a, a brilliant person. And he was actually a precursor, I would say, of sociobiology. Because in some ways, he expresses the view that after observing the animals, uh, some, some birds, he said, uh, most naturalists just take the bird and look at the bird in, the, in a biological way. But it would be very nice to, to observe these birds and animals for a long period to know their behavior in the wild. And this is something that uh, I think was at that time not really emphasized. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, around the time when the term sociobiology was coined by Edward O. Wilson. And exactly, the, the yeah. The famous textbook came out. I mean, also caused quite a lot of controversy on the on the far political left um, yeah. in the line of uh, genetic determinism and uh, and E.O. Wilson famously had a, a bucket of ice water poured on his head, which turned out to be maybe like a cup of tepid water, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as uh, uh, these things tend to get uh, blown out of proportion yeah. in history. But the um, the the idea of of uh, collecting these these specimens was was around in your 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 life before the explosives research, and then you return to it now. Yeah. Um, and you you wrote about the 
uh, the River of Doubt uh, expedition in your most recent book, which uh, which you have uh, which you published just in time to go to the Explorers uh, Club meeting, uh, it, and the 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 first work uh, that uh, well first of, of many works that I uh, that I will read of, of of yours was actually over over Christmas break when uh, when you. Uh, were kind enough to uh, to give me a copy of Yanomami, which is a book about the uh, Yanomami people that uh, inhabit. It's a native tribe that inhabits the area between Brazil and Venezuela, and I um, I wonder if you could you could tell me a little bit about the motivation for writing that book. Uh, Yanomami, I had always have a fascination with with, with Indians. And uh, as a child, I would hear stories of Indians. I remember at home we had a book with pictures uh, by a Swiss uh, ethnographer, or he was just a Swiss adventurer called Tupari, where he spent, he actually went to an Indian village and spent uh, several months there. And it was always a dream that I had to visit Indian tribes and to live with them and to, in a certain way, understand uh, very simple societies and what drives uh, very people when they live in a society that, that where the structure is very loose and very simple and is not so hierarchical. This is also uh, resonates with uh, Levi Strauss, who actually also followed exactly the same trail as, as Roosevelt, as our trail. Uh, and he was in search of a society that was so simple that none of the uh, impositions of, of, of culture or of civilization uh, existed. So I was fascinated by that and I made sporadic contacts with Indians. The Indian population in Brazil is very small and I, I happened to fall upon a book by a, a, a famous anthropologist, Napoleon Chagnon. I don't know if my son had it in his uh, class, I think he has in his class, and I was fascinated by the book, and I visited Napoleon Chagnon, he was a professor in Santa Barbara, and I talked to him, and he told me about the plight of the Yanomano, how they are being uh, invaded, their lands are being invaded, and the difficulties that they underwent, and he spent actually six years with them, and he studied them at great length, and his theories are also controversial, and uh, he considers uh, he's more of a Darwinist. So I put him as a character in this novel under uh, this guise there. And uh, I tried to establish contact in Brazil and tried to get permission to visit the Yanomama. And I could not get the permission. I tried very hard. I wrote actually a proposal to the Brazilian uh, National Science Foundation. Uh, I went to the tried right and left, and I, I, I was not able to to get success. They actually thought that I was, a, some people thought I was an American spy. There are th theories uh, that, that exist that the Yanomami land, there are efforts by, by uh, foreign organizations that want to create a Yanomami nation that lies between Venezuela and Brazil, and that would uh, um, conflict with the the uh, Brazilian boundaries. So uh, I was not able to visit them, but my dream is not dead. I didn't visit them physically, but I visit them in spirit. And this is the book, I think, that has a little bit of their, their plight. Okay. I see. And when you, when you write about su uh, characters so, so vividly, you must draw inspiration from people you know in your real life. Um, especially there are scientists in the book, there's a, a, a so an evolutionary psychologist in the book who uh, is reminiscent of your colleague that you, uh, that you, that you mentioned. Um, how do you write characters so that your professional colleagues don't see maybe a trade in their characters that, that, that maybe, maybe they don't like and they attribute to, to themselves? Well, this is a tricky situation and I think that as I as I, uh, as I evolve in my writing, I use more and more my imagination. But my first book, uh, Mayan Mars, I, I uh, was criticized for using characters that were fairly close to real characters. But uh, I was worried about it, but I had this uh, editor 
uh, Jennifer Redmond, and she told me, she was very encouraging, she said, uh, and it's interesting that sometimes uh, women have more of a sensitivity than men. And she said, uh, and I had also some uh, scenes, like uh, some love scenes, and I felt were a little, a little strong. And she said, absolutely not, Mark. They are absolutely, they are, are very apropos, and I like them very much. Another thing she said is, don't worry, because if people see themselves, they will not admit to it. <laughs> <laughs> and if they don't see themselves, that's all right. So, but I took some, some risks sometimes out of maybe my own limitations or because the characters somewhat, I see around, I look around myself and sometimes I see behavior that, that is interesting, that, is, uh, that would fit well in a novel and I think I incorporated it into, into the book. So uh, I think that uh, in my next novel uh, that, I, that I'm working on, I, I believe that the characters are all uh, really fictitious but in some cases i use the uh the explo i have one book on explosives and there i i base some characters on real characters uh, that that uh, that i encountered through my my career in the soviet union and in the united states the one on mayan mars are some characters that are uh involved in research projects and uh, i think that every writer has this problem a little bit there was a writer I heard him say that every time he finishes a book, he has to run out of his town for, for a couple of years, and, and then he comes back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the general plot of the book is that a, an international mining concern finds uh, natural resources in, a, in the vicinity of a, of a particular tribe, a particular village uh, of this uh, Yanomami um, uh, uh, people. Is your experience, as uh, you mentioned before we started recording, that your father was in the steel industry, did that play into, uh, is, is there some, some historical uh, 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 truth to, to this particular story? Well, uh, my father was in the steel industry. My brother, uh, is in the mining industry. So from the stories he passed on to me and from some things that, that have been reported in the media, it is absolutely true that, that uh, tribes were displaced in order to exploit uh, the mines. Not only mining companies did it, but many uh, 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 rubber tapping companies and big ranchers because the Brazilian law protects the Indians very much. Uh, Ron Don, who was the companion of Roosevelt in this expedition, he created the Brazilian uh, Foundation for, for Protection of the Indian. And if there is an Indian uh, uh, territory where, where or there are Indian tribes in a certain region, this region cannot be exploited. So the most convenient way is to get rid of the Indians. And this has been done in Brazil, unfortunately, throughout the Brazilian history many times, and the Indians were uh, the great losers in this large uh, uh, economic expansion of Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should uh, point out that, uh, that the characters as they appear at first are not the way that they, they end up uh, uh, being in, in, yeah. in the book. Um, so while, uh, while there are some archetypes, uh, the, the, there's much more that, that meets the eye to, to these characters, which is what I love about the book. Um, your protagonist is a, is a strong female character. She's an undergraduate at Berkeley, and, uh, and I wonder if there's a, uh, if you've tapped into the vein of, of um, popular uh, action adventure fiction that, that features female characters prominently like the the two most recent Star Wars movies and the Hunger Games um, did, did, did this occur to you or, or you just always wanted to have a, uh, a strong female lead mm -hmm. uh, yes I think it occurred to me and I enjoyed it and and uh, so I, uh, I I had created all these 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 uh, shady characters that were men, you know, so I thought <laughs> I'll have a redeeming, uh, somebody with redeeming values and, and I made her, her uh, a woman. Uh, 
in her case, I, I, uh, I, I based her a little bit on my daughter, my daughter, so uh, she knows about it. But I took some of the things when I, when I describe her or some of her quirks, I took from my daughter. So it is, uh, uh, I, I used her dog. Uh, she has a dog called Tonto, and my, dog, my daughter has a, has a dog called Tonto. She didn't go to Berkeley, but she was a little bit of a, 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 a radical like this. And uh, so one, one goes through a novel, and at, at, at the beginning, what happens is that, that uh, one has to establish a structure or, or start writing. And then, but from a certain point on, the novel, uh, the characters uh, develop their own life, and you are almost writing down what the things that they are doing, and then the uh, new protagonists come into play uh, as if we were walking uh, in a place and uh, we meet these different people. They all somewhat, they appear uh, somehow uh, mysteriously. Mm -hmm. okay. And would, would you say that you've had formal training in fiction writing? Uh, no, I did not. I had a little bit. I, I was, when I was a uh, teenage, I started writing little things, one page long, uh, little compositions uh, when I was uh, 12, and uh, I was encouraged by uh, my uh, mentor, who was Padre Hikis. and but Padre Hikis was very rigid grammatically. He really had a very, very, it's like mathematics, grammar was like mathematics for him. He was unforgiving in any gra gra grammatical mistake. He would give you if you had any grammatical mistake, you get a zero. But he didn't really teach the structure of writing and other things. But I did a lot of reading, and there was always in me a desire to write. So I actually asked my father when I, uh, and I used, I started writing poems, I believe I was 12 or 13. And I would collect them. I had a little red puffy book, and I would write them down and keep them. And uh, I always had this desire to, to join some intellectual uh, groups, but I never did it. I was not courageous enough, not bold enough to do it. And uh, I, uh, then I, I got into engineering, and what I have, when I got into engineering and I served in the Brazilian Army ROTC, there was so much uh, burden on me that I really kind of pushed back the, the writing. So I, when I was in the senior year, I collected all these little poems that I have. They are not, there's not great poetry. I'm not a Neruda, but uh, I, uh, I collected them and I published them in the print plan of the university. And, and without me knowing, the censors went through it. They took it and the president of the university called me in and he said, we are in trouble, he said. The military have taken hold of your book. You wrote some things that are a little bit insulting to them and they want to to question you, so, and I had applied at that time to a Fulbright scholarship, and I was a finalist to the Fulbright. I was like, I was going to get it. I was sure I was going to get it. Uh, I was very happy, and uh, I had developed an interest in anthropology at that time. And uh, I, I, uh, but then the thing is that I, 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 I forfeited even my graduation from college. I said I'd better get out of the country as soon as possible, before they. And I went and I actually talked to the military, and they said, no, if we open an, an investigation, you cannot leave the country as long as the investigation lasts. It could last two, three years. So I took off, and uh, I didn't tell my parents this. My parents were upset because I didn't go to graduation, but I left and then came to the University of Colorado where my brother was studying. And then I went, I crossed over to the University of Denver, and then they, they gave me an assistantship, and that's how I started my, my, my graduate career. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Would you say that, that writing, uh, so, so I, I think of academic research, yeah. even in the sciences and engineering, as to a zeroth order approximation, you're a writer anyway. Because yeah, that you, is true. You're publishing sometimes That's right. um, you are writing tens all the of time, thousands all day of long. words yeah. Per, yeah. per year. And, and it it's, tends to be polished you know, prose, too. You don't want to submit to a, to a journal if, it's, if it has yeah. errors in it. Um, uh, how much of the of the confidence that you have now as uh, as a author of fiction did you derive from writing papers and scholarly uh, books and articles? Well, 
Uh, there is a craft of writing fiction. There is a craft, and I took a class with Mike Sirota here at UCSD, how to make your novel better, how to make a good novel better. So, and then I hired him as an editor for, I believe, one of the books, and then he worked, he worked on, my, on my text a lot, and he actually showed me a lot of things, like dialogue. I still am very bad in dialogue. It's, English is not my na native language, but I struggle with it, and it, it's gotten better. How to have the point of view, different points of view, how you switch from one point of view to another one. These are the technical aspects. Um, I think that there's a tremendous uh, amount in common. I always say that, uh, as a joke, that many of my colleagues write fiction, <laughs> scientific <laughs> fiction, <laughs> and they, they claim it's real. And I see so many papers that make claims that, that uh, uh, are uh, beyond the, the reality. And uh, so they use imagination, they use some experiments, and then they, they write a story. So there's a lot in common, yes. And you have to go through many drafts. I think when I write something, it's lousy, it's horrible. And then you gradually work it and work it and work it until it becomes acceptable and then you work on it more until it becomes good. So that polishing of a, of a manuscript is an essential part. I see. And when you write, do you seek a sabbatical from the, from the department and the university or, or you work nights and weekends? Uh, How do you make time? Uh, I, I don't seek a sabbatical. I, I think I saw the sabbatical for my technical writing for this book. Uh, Biological material science. There, I spent uh, two months in uh, Cambridge, and I worked day and night on it, and got it got it done, and uh, together with Po Yu Chen. But on this writing, what I did is I just it. There is a certain I have a mission in my life. I think I have an obligation to write. I feel that's the case. My uh, I feel an obligation, and this is what I felt when I was I wrote my. Uh, implosion of scission, I said, well, I have to do it. That's something that I promised myself when I was a child to do it. And now, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. So I kind of, uh, I, I, I push myself and uh, I have a manuscript of a novel at home. It's all ready and I send it to the San Diego Book Awards. It actually was a finalist. And, uh, but I need to get to it. It's there, sitting there. I think the most difficult part, I think, is, is, is uh, once you get the story down, you get the story. I sometimes stay in the morning, I write for one hour, and I cannot write for eight hours either because one writes and then uh, one has to, uh, the batteries have to be recharged. One runs out of material to write. So I think that the writing process, uh, I think the, 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 the Getting the story together is, is, is the complex part. Writing it down, one can write uh, 500 words a day, so a book is 80,000 80, words. You can do it in 160 days. If you sit down for mm -hmm. one hour a day, you can do it in, 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 in a few months. So, so I, I just do it at home. And then the process of rewriting and rewriting, that's what takes a lot of time. Yeah. What time of day do you accomplish your most creative uh, work? Yeah, when I was a kid, when I was young, I was a night night person. <laughs> I would mm -hmm. write that. But I abandoned I abandoned all writing when I was 22. I for many years I didn't write. I actually went to the Amazon when I was 22, and I spent two months in in the Purus River, and I wrote a diary. There. I wrote a lot. I wrote a dictionary of a, of an Indian tribe, and. I wrote all of my observations, and then I was going to publish them. And then I, I arrived in, in Denver. They stole my suitcase in the uh, airport, and my whole manuscript was I didn't have a single. Uh, uh, I only had one single copy, OK? And then I, I focused on writing textbook. I wrote a textbook in Brazil, mechanical metallurgy. I translated it to English and became mechanical metallurgy, and then it, it evolved into my mechanical behavior. So I focused mainly on the technical writing, and I think the discipline of technical writing helped me a lot to work through uh, a novel because that discipline uh, for you or your force when you when you it's like uh, you have to take a class, you have to prepare a class, you have to write these things down. So the same way in a book, you have to write it down, you have to get it down on paper. See, whether you are inspired or not, I don't wait for inspiration. I just grind through it, through pain or, or, or through 
days of inspiration. Some days are lousy, but then it hopefully gradually works, works, comes together, yeah. So you mentioned that English is not your native language and that you're, you're from Brazil originally, you, but you speak other languages beyond Portuguese yeah. and English. And how did you come to, uh, to learn these languages and, uh, and, and, and why and how often do you speak them? Well, I'm, I'm in a very for fortunate situation. My, my parents are from Luxembourg. And Luxembourg, there are two national languages in Luxembourg, French and German. Actually, French is the official language. German is the, what people speak. They speak a German uh, dialect, Luxembourgish. So we lived in, in Luxembourg when I was seven to eight years old. And I didn't know a single word when I came to Luxembourg. My, my father was not, he was, uh, in this respect, he was very simple. Uh, he just put us in a school. The village school. I was a village school. There were kids from the first year to all the to the eighth year. Eight years of school. And then one teacher driving the teacher crazy. So they put me there, and uh, I for two months. And then I went to the city of Luxembourg. There I had my regular classroom, and I think I struggled. I was studying uh, two languages at the same time: French and German. The f German was horrible for me, uh, but French is very easy because it's a Latin language. So, and then I we returned to Brazil. And we had French and, 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 and English in school. And uh, uh, so, but French, I, I became very good. And then I went when I was 18 years of age, 17, I spent a year in Belgium and I did the Alliance Francaise, which is, uh, uh, exists here too. I did the fifth year of Alliance Francaise. And then I actually was in the literary section, uh, six, seven year, but then other priorities took took hold of me. And I, <laughs> my friends were all going out that night drinking beer and having fun and I was there studying French. So uh, I didn't pursue the literary French. But French was, is my, I would consider my second language. And then English was my third. And then German, I am very rusty at German, would be my fourth language. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, were, were you ever concerned or did you ever come across a situation where other scientists and academics saw that you were doing so much work in, in exploration and writing and they, they said, well, your, your, your career, your, your scientific career is going to, to take a hit by, by devoting energy outside or, or uh, is it something where you've, you've paid your dues and, uh, <laughs> and it doesn't matter? I think that, that I, I think that at this stage I paid my dues, I, I, as I say in my book, I jumped over the hurdles that comprise our profession and uh, I jumped over the hoops, right? And uh, uh, I, uh, I did not really advertise my writing. I would write my poetry. I never told anybody I, I was writing. And, and I, I think that uh, the reaction of my colleagues some, is, is very interesting. Some people, they, uh, they think it's... Uh, Say some people think it's interesting. Some people don't even mention it, as if I had never written. It's like uh, an anathema, anathema. <laughs> so I get uh, these different reactions. Uh, but uh, I, I, my, uh, I'm pursuing my uh, my my goal, uh, and I, I attribute it to a certain uh, part of me. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother, was she wrote very well, and she wrote poetry. Uh, Madeleine was her name, and I have a little story that uh, she, uh, my mother used to say that she wrote beautifully, and that they had found some 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 gold coins in or, or some coins in in their fields, a big amphora, and it was a Roman coin. So they took them home and they said, well, this belonged to the the Grand Duke Grand Duchess. We cannot keep these things. So they went and sent them to the the, the Grand Duke. And then one day, my mother actually was standing at home, and they, uh, my, my aunt wrote, uh, my grandmother wrote a letter. And uh, the, one day, there was this carriage comes into the, the, into the farm, and then my mother runs to the door, opens the door, and she sees this beautiful uh, dressed gentleman. And then when my grandmother comes, she was wearing an apron. She said, oh my god, you are the, the Prince Felix. You came because of the coins, and he said, "No, madam, I came because of the beautiful letter that you wrote." <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to thank you. So, and she loved to write, and she lived in the countryside, and she, and she had this talent. She would write poetry, and she would s write poetry, and, and 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 send it to the other girls in the classroom, 
and I think that that uh, this uh, this is kind of a this literary uh, talent uh, maybe maybe it, it resides within a person because my father's family they are uh, my father is an engineer uh, my grandfather was an engineer and then what were they before they were they they made wine and they were uh, uh, they grew wine and then there were some people that were business people uh, merchants so on my father's side uh, there is nobody who, who enjoyed right but my mother's side may be a, a little more bohemian mm -hmm. so maybe i inherited a little bit of that and i feel it's, a, it's an obligation i have to put it on paper because one has i feel that one 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 there's so many things in our mind that happen in our mind and they we think about them and they exist and then they dissolve away and uh, i tried to write a novel when i was 20 and i wrote and i wrote and i wrote in my room and i put it there on top of a closet uh, and then I, uh, when I came to the United States, I think uh, the maids were cleaning, and then they threw the whole thing away. <laughs> so well, you've I, lost a lot of pages. I've lost of, a lot, work so I cannot, I cannot afford to lose anymore. Yeah. See, so and I didn't tell anybody because I was doing it in secret. And I remember the name of the the novel. It was called Circles. Circles. Two concentric circles. Uh, it had to do with the Brazilian hinterland. It had to do with Indian. So. Uh, and this was totally lost, uh, but anyway, I, 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 I uh, persevered, okay? and that's the engineering quality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it's, and it's quite unusual for an engineering, uh, uh, a professional engineer to, to write fiction and to, 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 to popularize yeah. uh, or compared to uh, uh, biologists yeah. who seem to do this quite yeah, often doctors, um, medical doctors write a lot too, but very few engineers. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, in Brazil. I went there, and they had the first uh, World Congress of of writer engineer writers, and they invited me. So I went there and I gave a talk, and there were like uh, thirty of us uh, that were. Brazil has a very famous uh, writer that is an engineer. He's he's considered one of the Brazilian heroes, Euclides da Cunha, and he was an engineer, and. Uh, and he wrote uh, a, a book called Os Sertões, and this considered a classic in Brazilian literature. And then he proceeded to, to kill, uh, get killed very young. As, so I think that, that uh, yeah. Very few chemists, too. Very few <laughs> chemists, really? Um, and and uh, it seems to be something that biologists and cosmologists... Yeah, that is uh, right. They have a, big of, a broader vision. Medical doctors, because they deal with patients, with feelings, with uh, sentiments, with, with tragedy, and they write. Military people write, too, about their, their, their mm -hmm. adventures, yeah. Have you ever uh, been tempted to write about a fictional material scientist? I have two here. <laughs> <laughs> I have two. In, uh, in uh, Myanmar, there is one guy called Gustavo Chen, and he's a material scientist. And uh, he worked actually on uh, he worked on, on, on materials. Yes, he worked on materials. And then in the other book uh, in uh, Chechnya Jihad, I have one called Jean Claude Jean Claude Delvaux, and he is also a material scientist and explosives expert. And then he discovers a very powerful, super powerful explosive, and this is the beginning of the of the novel. Okay. Well, you're way ahead of my question. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the moment I knew that I wanted to uh, have you as my first uh, guest for this podcast was during a department meeting uh, on the beach in San Diego. We can, we can do that, where we had a, uh, a conversation over um, coffee and yogurt parfait, where uh, I, I told you that I was interested in writing fiction myself and that I was inspired by, uh, by Aldous Huxley, and not necessarily Brave New World, which everyone knows, but the, the earlier work, like oh, the, chrome, yellow, the yeah. chrome Yellow in the English <laughs> Country House. Uh, and I had just finished rereading it. I had read it when I was, uh, when I was 19, I think, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm going back through them in 15-year mm -hmm. increments. <laughs> and. Uh, and I had mentioned Chrome Yellow, and it was a, a book that's so obscure uh, that when you order it on Amazon, they print it for you on demand, and uh, and it comes with a date in mm -hmm. it that said you know, August twenty eighth, twenty sixteen. And you and you told me 
I, I read that, that quite recently <laughs> and, and, uh, and I knew that we, we spoke the same language, uh, so to speak. I, I, uh, you are much more met methodical probably than I am. I am, I am, uh, my reading has been, uh, I am a little bit what they call omnivorous. I, this Chrome Yellow, for instance, I, I was at, at Clare Hall in Cambridge, uh, where I go, I usually stay in Clare Hall, and I, I, I found it there, and I was looking for something, and I looked, and then there, it's sitting there, and I, I grabbed it and immediately took it to my room and read it, you see, and so, I should be more methodical in my writing. I try to be methodical. I try to read, at the, to read and then to analyze and to write a little review. Uh, I have a little book where I keep my reviews. And then sometimes, and then I go also to the Amazon and then I, I write a review and put it on the Amazon. That's kind of a discipline to myself, but I don't always do it. And I, sh and I think that's, that, that reading, when you, when you write, you, you read, and you have to be, uh, you can read much more critically, and then you, 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 you can maybe take some things that you can use, increase your vocabulary, improve your, 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 your style, and uh, so I, I, I think throughout my life, I, and I was not guided by anybody, I was kind of like, at home there were some books, and I would pick up books, and I would go to Molavaji, and often my, my, my buddies, they were out, I was reading at night and I took an interest at some time in the last year of engineering for anthropology. So I gathered all the books and I was, and my colleague, my friends, my buddies, they would go out drinking, chasing girls, uh, that was the <laughs> thing, and driving fast cars. And I was there reading. So I think uh, uh, in this respect, I was a little bit different from them. Okay? Maybe they had a happier uh, Used than I. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have particular favorite authors um, that you look to for inspiration or writing styles? Even I, 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 I started. I would read when I was young in Brazil. Uh, I remember when I was ten, eleven. I, I, I read all of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan books and things like this. But these are kind of young adults. Then I started reading uh, Brazilian authors. José de Alencar, Marshal de Assis. Then there was a Brazilian author that, that nobody knows here, but it's called Guimarães Rosa. He only wrote two books. He was a doctor, and his book is, is a masterpiece. Then I, I read uh, uh, Hemingway, of course, uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, I, uh, at a certain point, I read... Uh, uh, okay, I, I read... Uh, I, I read the uh, non-fiction books. Uh, Hermann Hesse, I, I think I read, I went through all his books. Uh, of course, Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. But I don't, uh, I, I, and Dostoevsky when I was uh, in, in college, I read Dostoevsky. So, and none of my engineering colleagues were interested in reading this, so I didn't even have anybody to converse with, <laughs> you see. So uh, I, I uh, it was a little bit, I, I felt, I was afraid because it gave me fear because when the more I read and I would enter into an imaginary world and I would go into this world and I would deep, go deeply into it and then I would, and I could not get out of it and get back into reality would, would be for me a, a, a shock and I had difficulty with reality and I preferred being, being in this, uh, what do you call it, virtual world. Mm -hmm. But I was able to get out and finish my engineering studies, <laughs> get done with life. <laughs> my father actually said, I, Dad, I want to become a writer. He actually got me in touch with, with, a, with, a report, with a journalist, and he said, the best way to become a good writer is you become a journalist. You write, 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 and then he got me in touch with a journalist, and I, I did translation, so the guy uh, was not very inspiring character, but he asked me to uh, translate articles from French to Portuguese for him. So I would do this, I would go there, as a volunteer, and then uh, he would then publish them in the Brazilian uh, newspaper, and it kind of got got me mad because he would just put himself as as author. So that's the first uh, instance I was <laughs> exposed to plagiarism. <laughs> and he had all these articles. He would give me this very complicated Cahier du Cinéma. I don't know some other Le Monde, and I had to to change to translate them. I would give them to him, and then the next day the thing would come out with his name. But. Uh, uh, 
I, I kind of, uh, uh, my father said, get, become an engineer, my son. Study engineering, you can always write later. And he said, and also he said, and my mother used to say that you cannot write right now, she said, because you don't have any experience of life. You need experience of life to write, which I don't agree necessarily. I think that uh, many writers, they wrote when they were very young, you write about your experiences when you're young, you see. But in my case, it came late, you see. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I struggle a lot with writing. Uh, I think that if I had dedicated myself fully to writing, maybe I would have become a, a, a better writer. It's interesting that you mentioned journalism and yeah. uh, translation because you have a deadline and there can't be a writer's yeah. block because that is right. You have <laughs> you, to do it. You have to get, do it. Get it out. So many words. And and in some sense, uh, scientific writing as well because it's you have a, a yeah. deadline for yeah. a, for an article. So, what are your next uh, literary projects and okay. adventures and perhaps uh, research projects? Okay. So in in research, I got into this biological research and. Uh, I tell jokingly to my, my friends that in the end of the day, I'll be known for the biological work and not for the explosives work. <laughs> they get very mad at me. But anyway, I think that the, the re repercussion of this work is great. Biological and bio-inspired materials. Everybody's talking about it. You publish a paper. Uh, the news media just picks up on it. The, 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 the most... Uh, Childish thing is taken, uh, taken, uh, and, 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 and because people relate to it. I think people relate to it. People don't relate to the, to the mm, mathematical aspects of propagation of a shock wave and generation of defects in the material. Who cares? You see. But we all know who Toucan Sam is. Yeah, we know who <laughs> Toucan Sam is. We know the abalone shells, the hair. I published a paper on hair now, and they are saying that. Uh, they uh, wrote several articles on it on, on the news about hair, that hair is going to be the next armor, and they show these beautiful ladies with blonde hair, and then uh, that's the, the, the headline. They're kind of making fun of it, too. But anyway, I think that, that uh, this is, I'll continue this area of biology. I have three areas, actually. I have nanocrystalline metals, uh, extreme deformation and failure of material, extreme behavior of materials, and the third one is biological and bio-inspired materials. So I plan to continue, uh, I don't know, f until the sunset with these, or at least three areas, if I can get funding, that, that's a big challenge too. And then literary, I wrote a novel called uh, Our Lady of the Squids, and it's ready, it's sitting there, and uh, uh, I think it's a good novel. It's a little bit in the in the in the in the style of uh, of uh, what you call it magic realism. It has some elements of magic realism, and I I de I'm developing my style in a sense that Mike Sirota, my editor, who also is author of several books, he was disciplining my style, my sentences to be short and to the point, and cut down, cut down, cut down. But then. I decided, well, I am a Latin American writer. I'm a South American writer. I, uh, I am a little different, you see. I don't have to fit into this, uh, this template. So now I'm kind of developing my own style. I let my imagination flow and at the same time have, have a plot that people can read and follow. So this, I think, this novel is uh, it's a very interesting novel. It's about the uh, squids, you see in Baja, and I traveled to Baja many times, and uh, it's about squids, and uh, it's about uh, uh, the squid, is so there's where the magic realism comes in. These squids, there are giant squids on the beach, and this woman is, is, is ravaged by a squid, you see, and then nine months later, a little, a little girl is born, and then it's the story of this little girl, and the redemption of the sea, the, the, how the, uh, the pollution of the sea, the destruction of the sea, and this girl will be the redeemer of the oceans. Okay, that's why she's our lady of the squids, you see. Mm -hmm. so and it, I also have the, in the meantime, as a background, the narco wars are raging, you see. And, uh, uh, and there's a lot of fighting and things like this. And then I put a character in. I put a character in from, uh, from Carlos Fuentes. It's called, uh, there's a, a man called... Uh, the Old Gringo, I don't know if you've heard of this novel. The Old Gringo, it's a beautiful novel. It's about an old, old American. It's a true story. He goes into Mexico. He's like 70 years of age. He's old. And he rides his horse across the Rio Grande. And he goes to Mexico. And he joins the revolutionary forces. And he came to Mexico 
to die, you know, because he's old and he's abandoning. So I put one of these characters is, is an old gringo. So I put him in there, uh, and he's. Uh, so I think it's I think it's it's a good novel. I, it needs to be worked on, and and the, the, the but the difficulty is to find an agent and find uh, now it is very very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I enjoy the process of writing, but the process of of finding agents is extremely difficult and complex, ex especially since I don't have a, how do you call it? I don't have a, is I don't have a. I tried many agents, and uh, I so I just publish I, with the small publishers and with a smaller market, and uh, I'm happy with that. Okay, mm -hmm. content with that. Okay, terrific. <laughs> How about uh, adventures? Uh, not necessarily on the level of <laughs> yeah. River of Doubt, yeah, yeah. but um, okay, River of Doubt. I, I uh, yeah, okay, I, adventures. I I joined the Explorers Club. I have this little thing here. They gave it to. And so the Explorers Club is a wonderful organization, and they have actual flag expeditions. You can actually join their expeditions. And I, this one on the River of Doubt, we did not finish the last part. That's the easy part. We still want to do that. But I would like to go, the next goal would be to go, I would like to go to the Llano Mano and spend some time with the Llano Mano. And I want to have as a, as a, as a, what's it called, an excuse. I want to measure uh, the velocity at which they shoot arrows and the accuracy because in another generation they will never they will use guns and that that will have completely disappeared so if i can get the the technical tools to do it uh, measure the velocity determine accuracy so i will i will try to work with the brazilian uh, officials it's a long process of getting permission it's bureaucratically very complex but i was able to get it for this for this uh, i was able to get the proposal in and uh, with two, with two Brazilian officers, we submitted the proposal, we had to get shots, we had to get permissions, we had to get a tremendous amount of documentation is required, you see, by the Brazilian uh, Foundation. And I think it's good because not everybody should go in there, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, before we wrap up, I wonder if you could tell our audience uh, where they can learn more about you, where they can get your books. Ah, and okay, yeah. Uh, I, I have I have a site uh, markmyers.org m a r c myers.org and also you just uh, go in Amazon and all my books are listed in Amazon. Okay, yeah. terrific, and thank yeah. you so much for your time. Well, I have to thank you. Okay, it's a great pleasure. There you have it. Thanks to Mark again for his time. If you'd like to hear more conversations like these, please subscribe to the podcast and share it on social media. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my research group's website can be found at group.darrenlapomi.com. My YouTube channel, Facebook page, and Twitter feed can all be found under my name, Darren Lapomi. That's D-A-R-R-E-N-L-I-P-O-M-I. -I. Finally, I'd like to give credit to my brother-in-law, John Viviani, for letting me use his music. This track is titled The Real You by Filthy Funk, which consists of John on guitar and bass, Nick Murray on keys, Jervon Trammell on drums, and Daniel Ponder on vocals. Thanks very much for listening. See you next time on Molecular Podcasting. You